interesting things about film is that, you know, most of us that study film these days take what they call an auteur approach. And that's the idea that even though it takes thousands of people to make a movie, a real movie is the vision of one person, usually the director. Someday, sometimes people say it's the producer, but almost always it's the director, like a Terrence Malick. But the strange thing about film is, you know, clearly with someone like a Terrence Malick or whatever, you, you do see one vision going in there. But still, film is a collaborative art. And especially when we think about it from a Christian point of view, I think that the closest thing to a modern film is the old medieval Gothic cathedral. And what I mean by that is those great Gothic cathedrals, they, they generally had a master craftsman, right, who was kind of in charge of everything. But there were all these other hands doing the work and whatnot and things like that. Uh, and so I, I do think that, again, even though it's just easier to talk about film by looking only at the director, I mean, what do you do with someone like Spielberg who almost never writes his movies? He almost mm -hmm. always has a writer. And of course, he's got his wonderful John Williams to do his music and things. So I think it might be helpful to see one creative mind that's organizing everything, but there's also something kind of democratic about it, in the sense that includes the Middle Ages, uh, mm -hmm. where everybody's working together. So it, it's a strange medium. I definitely think there's a unity of, of vision. I agree with you about the auteur. Obviously, there's a lot of people that bring uh, different aspects to the film. They, they um, like for instance, with Ex Machina and Alex Garland, you know, reading about uh, their process, or even like Coen Brothers with No Country for Old Men, is that they, they have an idea, and then they go looking for what will express that idea, and people bring to them, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? And they select from those ideas which are brought to them. So they're obviously somewhat editing and bringing things together, but there's a unified vision or a unified idea, which is kind of bringing those ideas to, um, uh, those thoughts together. So like, for instance, in Ex Machina, I don't think Alec Gar Garland originally had the idea of a glass box in which Caleb was in. Uh, that wasn't in his mind when it started, but obviously many people brought together different ideas based upon the vision that he had for his, his script. So he's saying, this is what I want to do. Here's some ideas that I had. And then people get that idea and they run with the same idea, trying to um, flesh it out together, uh, as it were. That's interesting. You know, but by the end, like Ernest Lehman wrote, uh, wrote North by Northwest to be a perfect Hitchcock film. People mm -hmm. would write movies just for him. In fact, Vertigo was based on a novel that these French guys wrote, hoping that it would be a Hitchcock film. <laughs> you know? You're right, that is an interesting point. They start like, I like your vision, and I want to see if I can write something that will allow you to enhance your vision, which I think is yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think about um, some of the particular constraints then on modern film, I guess? Um, maybe, maybe I'm wrong with this, but do they have to sort of bend to the market um, more than, say, they would have back in the day? Is there more of a uh, um, coercion based on the kind of criteria of success, I guess? Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, you're not going to make everything you want to make. And it's uh, market drives it. Also, you know, I mean, I think China, for instance, is driving a lot of decisions that are being made. What kind of films are being made here in the United States uh, before other, you know, more American centered films would be made back in the 80s and 90s. But now um, that market is huge over there. So there's a lot of what we won't say, what we will say, what topics we'll cover, um, because they recognize that the, the market isn't just in it. And that, that really does kind of can make confuse a little bit, I think that the meanings that come across in films when you broaden out to multiculturalism to that extent, you can't really read a, a movie as well because it doesn't really have a location. It doesn't really have an audience in mind. It just has this bigger, broader audience. I guess Mad Max was probably something that would be a big, broad audience, but still had a deep meaning. But um, that's interesting. I just- It's hard. I mean, you know, even in old Hollywood, if you, if you want to get an example of a crazy vision, Watch the old movies by Joseph von Sternberg that he made with Marlena Dietrich. I don't know how they let him make five of those movies. They're unbelievably personal and creepy and strange, mm -hmm. black and white. So every so often people break through. I mean, Vertigo is an incredibly personal film that somehow is also, you know, made, made some money and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's odd. Like I said, I, I don't know how Terrence Malick keeps making these great long slow movies or how that guy Tarkovsky, I don't know, maybe the Soviets were paying him. Right. You know, I don't, I don't know how these people, you know, get away with it sometimes, but, 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 but they do it somehow. I mean, it used to be just make a small enough budget and you can do it, but 
some of these movies still are very expensive. Uh, uh, do you th it's perhaps that they're trying to go for the awards because the awards obviously help yeah. them make money and obviously bring accolades to the studio which created them and um, gives them clout among the people that are also making films. Obviously, you know, our, uh, artists, more artists want to come work for a film that they might win accolades and respect from their peers. So um, maybe they get into a niche like that. I, I'm not sure. So I think you're right. And that happened in old Hollywood, uh, you know, like an MGM or something. They would spend money on what they called prestige pictures, which were usually long literary and they would often win the Academy Award. And mm -hmm. so they would spend money on those. But then they had a studio system that made, you know, simple Westerns and all that that could give money to make those big ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, we don't always have that here when it's picture by picture and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But you're right, that prestige. And I mean, a good example is we say it's all about money, but they all know that they make much more money with a PG movie than they do with an R. Mm -hmm. But they still will make an R because they're trying to get sort of the accolades of, of, mm -hmm. of you know, again, impress their friends and things like that. And yeah, everybody every so often something, you know, grotesque, like, like the Joker makes a fortune. I mean, it's, I mean, it was well made enough, but you know, it's basically a taxi driver remade with comic books. I mean, it's mm -hmm. the strangest thing I've ever seen and yet it made a fortune. I'm yeah. not exactly sure how, but. Do you very, think, very um, the Joker kind of did so well because it speaks to our time and the kind of pearls of ideology. I think um, Jonathan Bajot has done a few videos about it and it does seem to speak to what he calls the, um, the inversion of society as well, that everything's upside down so that clown-like characters come to the fore and then you see this parallel even with people like Kanye doing so well and um, the fact that it takes someone crazy to highlight the insanity of the society as a word. Does that make sense? And you know, and also you, you might almost see this now, you know, you know, as we lose Christianity and we lose transcendence, when you look at what Joaquin Phoenix did, losing all that weight, I mean, it, it, it's become a new thing where the artist has to literally suffer. Did you ever see, I think it was called The Machinist with Christian Bale. He also went down to a skeleton, the opposite of De Niro who became super fat for, for Raging Bull. But, what I'm saying is almost this idea of the art, like the artist is monk, the old crazy Simon Stylites who lived on top of a, of a yeah. pillar for his life. I mean, it's, it's, but I mean, it's weird. It's almost like this is our new saint, our new monk who is suffering for art. And, and we have to give him an Oscar just because he punished his body, a new asceticism. It's yeah. very odd and kind of scary, really. But. Yeah, <laughs> it's really interesting. Uh, do you have oh, anything to add to that there, Mark? What was the question again, Mark? With that, that... I was wondering um, about Pajot's basic idea, if I read it right, that um, the movies like The Joker speak to us so much because of the kind of ideological moment and the, um, jo the Joker-like character, even with Kanye ones that he's been looking at, that they um, are at the forefront of leading a potential flip of the society that's gone so crazy that it takes somebody um, out there to get the message across, I guess. I, I think that Joker did a phenomenal job and it was a good movie on its own, but I think the real drive for how it made so much money was the, was the fascination with uh, uh, Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight, um, mm -hmm. so that people really enjoyed The Dark Knight. I mean, it has a real strong following, even, even among YouTube. If you make, I, I don't remember how many YouTube videos there are on The Dark Knight on, the, on YouTube itself, but there's a huge, plethora. If, you, if you're a video essayist at all, you've done a video on The Dark Knight. Every yeah. single person does a video on The Dark Knight. And it was Heath Ledger and obviously his, his untimely death, but also his remarkable performance in that film, but also what that film meant uh, in terms of Christopher Nolan, all those kind of things. And then this other director comes along with a similar style version of a Heath Ledger, Ledger type Joker. Mm -hmm. And you instantly have the immediate attraction to people going, hmm, I'm interested in that, that, that type of dark uh, he, he played your type Joker that he played. And obviously, uh, Joaquin Phoenix does his own job at the jo as the Joker, uh, which is phenomenal in and of itself. I think it equals uh, and rivals uh, that of Heath, Heath Ledger's. Um, and I think that's why people enjoyed it. It was just a phenomenal movie as it is. Most people have not seen Taxi Driver, the person that, you know, people who watch this film. So they're, they're not even aware of the, uh, the, the illusion. But um, yeah, for the moment, it, it, it made sense to people. They enjoyed it and uh, they got something out of it. But I just think that the rush and the push and the, and the, um, 
the excitement for that film was due to The Dark Knight more than anything else. Mm. What did you all think too? Because you know, you, you had The Dark Knight and you had The Joker, they both were very dark, they had The Joker, but it just seemed to me watching it that The Dark Knight still was taking place in something of a moral universe. I mean, yeah. the most famous part being you know, the whole moral dilemma about blowing up the ships and all kind of stuff you play in philosophy class. But it seemed that the Joker, I mean, I'll just give you an example that, that troubled me about the Joker is that we, we want to hate Bruce Wayne's father because mm -hmm. somehow we think he's the father of the Joker. But mm -hmm. by the end of the movie, we actually learn that the Joker's mother is insane mm -hmm. and that he was adopted as an orphan. And yet somehow we're still supposed to hate Bruce Wayne's father. It reminded me of Kavanaugh, that even though nothing was proven against him, the very fact that a hashtag was put against him now makes him morally reprehensible. Am I reading it wrong or did I still feel like we're supposed to hate Bruce Wayne's father even though he was not guilty? Right, I think obviously in the Joker, they, they definitely want you to feel a sense of, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a belonging to the Joker. Like I'm on the side of the Joker. Like you, you're supposed to feel that at the end, but you're also supposed to be feeling disturbed by that in the end. Like it's not supposed to be something you are wholly okay with. I don't think um, that there is some kind of, um, yeah. But I think um, actually, I, I, I do. I felt like I mean, talking about the Joker. If we go a bit deeper, and I think we were supposed to feel a sense of um, of. Um, yeah, of, of, of aversion to the Joker, even though if you're supposed to sympathize with him, like you're supposed to sympathize with him, you're supposed to feel feel his thoughts, feel it for him, but at the same time you go, I don't want to live in a world with Joker. So I think it does have the conservatism of The Dark Knight, that it was a very conservative film. So I don't think you're supposed to like hate okay. Bruce Wayne in the end, or even, or at least, or at least, um, come on, what's the Wayne that we're talking about? We're talking about Bruce oh, Wayne. Oh, yeah. Not, not Thomas Wayne. We're supposed to, we're supposed to not hate Bruce Wayne. We're supposed to still like Bruce Wayne, but you're still supposed to get a side of the Joker that go, These are, this is a real world yeah. with real people. And that was, here's what I'm saying, is that Christopher Nolan made a, cart, a comic book uh, movie that wasn't so comic bookish. Mm. And I think people liked that, that it was more yeah. like, uh, like um, it's more like Logan, actually. The Joker yes. was more like Logan. Yeah, Alan Moore's, it was more like Alan Moore's, um, come on, what's his comic called? It's called, um, the Watchmen. Oh, The Watchmen, yeah, Watchmen. It's more true. like a real world with real comic. What would it be like with fallen heroes? Like if we had heroes like us. Um, what, and, why do you think though, that he chose to not have the Joker kill Bruce Wayne's parents, but a Joker, some random guy with a mask? Because I don't think that was Joker that killed him. It was just some crazy guy who was right. infected by the Joker, if you will, and just shot him. That was right. just odd that they didn't have it be the Joker you know, as it is in the, you know, the original movie. Um, right. Um, but I, I don't know, that was odd. Uh, I guess that this, I don't know, it was, like I said, it, I mean, it, it is of a piece. I think, uh, I think uh, Matt, you and I were talking on the phone about, uh, I remember this, whatever it was, 15 years ago when Mat uh, not Matrix, uh, when Memento and Fight Club and Being John Malkovich all came out very, very close to each other. And all of them were basically about a loss of identity. Mm -hmm. Who am I? And I right, think right. We're, we're seeing that again. We're, we're struggling with who am I? And, and just the whole strangeness of the Joker having that absolutely terrifying laugh, but right. he's also got that little card he shows everybody who says, hey, I'm sick. This, this is just my thing. It's my tick. Uh, yeah. Don't worry about it. Uh, but just, again, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, it ties in with the transgender in the sense that who am I? My personality is fluid. And it's kind of scary that the real Joker doesn't come out till he kills his own mother, mm -hmm. his creator, although she really isn't his creator, I guess, because he's right. adopted. But it's, it's sort of like he, he's not really, you, you know, usually it's the Oedipal thing. You have to kill off right. the father. Uh, but here, the killing of the mother releases him. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was strange and disturbing. <laughs> his, yeah, yeah, he completely, yeah, went off the rocker after that. You know, if you're talking about transgender as an identity, V for Vendetta, which is very much like yeah. the Joker, uh, that identity of who is the who is V and V is all of us, and he has no specific identity. His identity, in fact, is fluid throughout the whole film because they, they start to say he's this person, and then they start to say he's this person. So you're constantly trying to figure out who V is through the entire film, but in the end, you realize that V is everybody. It's not supposed to be one particular person. That he is all of these people and more. That he is a Satan. He is Jesus. He is he is Guy Fox. He is. Uh, 
you know, uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel. He's, he's right. everything, you know, I mean, he makes up all these Zorro, he's Zorro, he's, he's a woman, he's a man, you know, right. you don't quite know who he's going to be next. It's, I mean, one of the, one of the disturbing things too, towards the end of Joker is the same disturbing aspect of, of, of the first uh, Silence of the Lamb, right? Where the very end of the movie, he's on the phone and he says, I'm about to have an old friend for dinner. And we know he's going to kill and eat the prison guard. Now, the prison guard's a little bit nasty, but I don't think he deserves to be killed and eaten. He is, after all, doing his job. Right. And, the, and comparing that, of course, to Robert De Niro being killed in The Joker. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's being a little bit nasty. But then again, he's an unbelievably tr tr terrible comedian. Not mm -hmm. fun at all. Of course, he's going to be made fun of when he's, we, we think he's funny, right? Uh, right. But again, they, they built it up to a fever pitch where... Maybe we're not exactly cheering when Robert De Niro dies, but we feel yeah. no remorse, really. Yeah. And, and yeah. that, too, you know, getting into the mind of the, of the twisted person. Uh, mm -hmm. is, that's empathy, but it's kind of a disturbing kind of empathy. I, I honestly think, that, there, and I've told Marcus this in terms of the way we read the film, I, I think it was meant at this time, this place, and I think it largely has to do with the whole political situation with Trump and Antifa. Yeah that Trump and Antifa, even though they're on polar opposite sides, perhaps of the political spectrum, they are in some sense entangled by the fact that they are on the extremes of, for instance, in this film, the attack on the media is uh, basically executing the media is exactly what the Joker does, mm -hmm. which is an excellent, what, what, what Trump is doing. But they, they, in essence, but Trump and Antifa seem to be on, like Antifa seem to be fighting Trump, but in actuality, they're on the same side because in essence, they are, they are, breeding grounds for the same chaos that this this chaos that says let's not have you know reason debate and reason but let's let's say you're an evil person you're a bad person or let's make fun of people let's let's um rather than saying let's sit down and reason together we're pulling ourselves apart in this world of uh, this rift between ourselves even right. though we think i don't know we think we're being rational we think we're we're fixing the right problem is there, and that's is why i think is there a glimmer of hope when he lets the dwarf live <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the me I, th I think that's the message of the film. I think that's the heart of the film right there. Is that that basically you were the one that was nice to me? Yeah, basically, yeah, you were the one that was nice to me. Unlike yeah. you know the nasty people and things like that. Yeah. We, have we answered our your question, Mark? I, I know we're, we're wandering, but it's okay. <laughs> no, that's, that's perfect. Um, I think that description to Mary as well with something that Catherine Burwell Singh said the other day. She said about how we, we imagine right and the left on a line but um, that it's more like a circle where they do, if you go around right enough or left enough, they do come back and meet somewhere down here, as it were. And um, you got the attempt to control and the um, desire to have the power uh, in itself, as it were, rather than actually um, have that reason dialogue or whatever, if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that yeah. Makes, makes sense to me. Um, so just, I'd love to kind of segue to, from that to another similar play of Dark and Light uh, as it were. So the Grimm brothers and the old classic stories were a bit darker than the, the Disney, Disney fade versions that we're kind of used to. I just mm -hmm. wanted to ask you about that. Um, what were some of the virtues of those maybe more dark tales and the original Pinocchio, um, Galati's Pinocchio and things like that? rather than the way they've been portrayed by Disney and made um, kind of neutered, maybe, if that's the right word? Or do you have any thoughts about that? You know, it, it's, it's such a shame because, you know, they often call them the great five. I mean, the first five animated movies by Disney are just absolutely brilliant works of art that are totally different. So we obviously start with Snow White, we've got Dumbo, we've got Bambi, we've Fantasia. got Pinocchio, and we've got Fantasia. And the unfortunate thing is they didn't make much money. Snow White made a fortune. But the other ones actually didn't make much money, and Fantasia might have, but the war started, and so we lost the, you know, the, the whatever, more aesthetic audience or something. But those early movies, I mean, Pinocchio, when, when you know, when, when, uh, when the, the kids turn into donkeys, mm -hmm. is one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen in film. Yeah. Then yeah. what happened is, I think he made Cinderella, and that made him a fortune, and that pretty much established, and they're still good movies, <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we lost uh, a Santa, we, I guess we didn't get it back until they allowed, um, uh, what, what's his name, uh, Mufasa to die, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's back to, you know, Bambi saying, mother, yeah. you know, yeah. you know they, they hadn't done that in a long time, had they? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it showed, there was, there was much more uh, grip, grip to it, grit to it. Um, 
Do you but I don't know, like, you know, I mean, we, we also do need our fairy tales. We do need mm-hmm. a sense of, you know, good and evil, right and wrong, where there's, you know, that's why Shrek, even though it's a lot of fun, is also kind of destructive because you don't want to take away our fairy tales. You know, a lot of people thought it was a wonderful egalitarian message that the princess turned out to be ugly at the end. But mm-hmm. what their understanding is that one of the reasons we go to fairy is it's a place where the outside and the inside reflect each other. So mm-hmm. we can tell by looking at them. We can tell by looking at the orcs, although it's a little more complex even than that. In something like Snow White, the, the, the queen is also beautiful. The evil queen is beautiful, but it's a different kind of beauty. It's mm-hmm. an evil, cold, uh, self-centered beauty where, where you know, the, the, the whole appeal of a Cinderella or a Snow White is that in a sense, they don't even know they're beautiful. And then they see their beauty in the eye of the beloved. So it's, it's not that simple, but there's something that happens in fairy. And when we want to mess with that, uh, it, there's a little bit of a danger to that. Um, mm-hmm. But there can be, you know, frightening, you know, I mean, yeah, what, 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 in, the, in, the, in the original Goldilocks, I think, I, I mean, the original uh, um, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, she, she does get eaten. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it reflects kind of our sanitized world, Mark. I'm not sure. Um, or our, our pretense to a more sanitized world. It seems to me that the Grimm's fairy tales written in the what, late 1800s, I mean, early 1800s, late 1700s, basically a collection of earlier tales. Um, but they were very much dark because they lived in a more dark world without police, without, um, without someone to watch over, protect you, you know, all those kind of things. So we feel more relatively safe in our world and we, we have a sense of schools so that kids have a, a uniform, more or less uniform, um, orderly um, way they, they are trained. Um, pretty much everyone's experience is almost, you know, a cookie cutter in terms of how they were raised. Whereas before, I don't think it was quite that way in terms of you could be going down the street, you might be homeschooled, you might go off to school, you might, you know, your parents might be well off, you might be on the verge of starvation, there's no, there's no um, network for you. So I think that those types of fears, real fears, genuine fears, um, are expressed in the Grimm's fairy tales to a greater extent than perhaps the more sanitized versions today, which are, are dealing with more psychological feelings, maybe a little bit things that are scary under the bed. But really, the world is, we, th- we feel, we feel that the world is more safe than it used to be. Um, mm-hmm. And in some ways it is, uh, because we don't, we don't have those terrors. Uh, we have lights that we can turn on instantly. We have lights around our house, so we don't live in a night you know, that's dark perpetually. And that's when thieves, and traditionally, if you have lights around your house, if you have lights around your house, you're more than likely not going to get broke into. Things aren't going to happen. But in a world without electric lights, I mean, think about the terrors that are out there. And so you want to basically inculcate. It's kind of almost like inoculate. Inoculate your kids to fear. Like, there are real fears, and you have to instill in those that things about how to overcome those fears. And that's where the stories, those, those older stories come in in a way that Disney doesn't really delve into as much. You know, Matt, an, an interesting uh, parallel to what you're saying is a lot of people are now theorizing the reason why things like allergies are getting so bad and so crazy is because we have raised our kids yes. in a completely sanitized yes. world, literally. Uh, yeah. And I think you're right, they, they need to, to face their fears. I mean, I know when my kids were growing up, you know, I would let them watch something like Lord of the Rings or even Braveheart at a very young age because even though there was violence in that movie, I felt that it was meaningful violence. Mm -hmm. Whereas until they were well into their teens, I wouldn't let them watch a serial killer movie, even if it was edited for television, because Mm -hmm. I didn't want mindless uh, stuff like that, but but real fears. And and Mm -hmm. and, even Hans Christian Andersen's tales, which are unique because he wrote them instead of collecting them, they're Mm -hmm. darker than we know. The the, the, the Little Mermaid turns into sea foam at the end. She does sacrifice herself. Uh, and and the, the Snow Queen is very scary. And the, the red shoes, the girl gets her feet cut off. I mean, uh, they're, they're pretty scary too, because we, 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 said we learn to deal with our fears. C.S. Lewis said he preferred fantasy to what he called school stories. And school mm-hmm. stories would be where, you know, the, the picked on kid, uh, get, you know, becomes the, the leader of the school, gets back. And, and he said, those are the dangerous stories because they breed vanity and envy and covetousness in people, Mm -hmm. whereas a true fairy tale teaches us a respect and a fear and a kind of awe for, I mean, fairy, what what is, uh, Tolkien calls it the perilous realms. Mm -hmm. Fairy is is, is a scary place. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not all beautiful. And and, and, and I'll just give you a quick example to show how we seem to not understand that. 
okay, in the movie Prince Caspian. Now, I knew that they would have to change the plot a lot mm -hmm. because the original novel has a super long flashback, all of that stuff. But what I was amazed was is that they removed the most cinematic part of the novel. And that is when, while the boys are fighting the duel, the mm -hmm. girls are on the back of Asplan, and with the help of Bacchus and his mm -hmm. wild yes. women, they're yes. breaking up the countryside. Yes. What could be more cinematic than that? Yeah. But they left out that part. I don't think they understood it. I don't think they understood divine madness. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, they, they couldn't un understand the idea of boys and girls actually doing something different rather than fighting side by side. So they couldn't deal with that. But again, they, they lost. And you know, some Christians don't know what to do with that either. What, what's Bacchus, the god of wine, women, right. and the god of college fraternities? What is right. he doing in the children's? But it's right. There's a, there's a good kind of madness that heals. It's what, it's what the Catholic calendar used to be like with, with feasts and fasts mixed in there and Mardi Gras. And of course, now we understand Mardi Gras, but we don't understand uh, Lent. But, but I mean, we've lost that, that sense of, of the, you know, you get it in the beginning of Hunchback, the, um, the carnival of fools, you know, that carnival atmosphere, that madness that actually restores your sanity. Mm -hmm. and we've lost that sacred. So you, you trying to live, uh, Mark, you trying to live on that sacred calendar? Well, yeah, so <laughs> if I can, um, I sort of have to constantly form habits because I've been brought up. What you see is such a secularized environment. So even um, whenever I grew up in Northern Ireland, uh, you're Catholic, but it's a very ethnic identity. And um, the rituals that you follow, as it were, are more political and uh, tribal, if that makes sense. Right. It's just kind of disturbing, really. And uh, that's why I think people like C.S. Lewis are so important. I think C.S. Lewis is a, a figure who would actually unite people in Ireland in a mere Christian manner. Um, so say Catholic, Protestant all together, which is what, part, part of what I like about him, apart from the art itself and it, all his books and everything else. Um, I think Van Morrison, people like that too, that I've come to love do the same thing in music. And um, I, I get into James K. Smith's books there as well and how he goes into all these secular liturgies that you have to be cognizant, oh, yeah. cognizant of to sort of get back to the the old Christian fast feast patterns and stuff so even as a teacher I see them in school all the time I see how children from a very young age are brought up to say celebrate pride month and stuff like that so they're richly in the classroom teach this but it's, it's a way of teaching history, too, that is like a sacred history, as it were. Um, it's the same with black history, one month right. of the year. I thought over and over and over again, like Coleman Hughes, the African-American scholar, talks about that, how history is told in a different way, and um, that he sort of resents that. I think I resented that as I became an adult, looking back to my childhood as an ethnic tribal identity in Ireland. So I think that's part of the skepticism I have to that way of viewing the world now in places like America with African-Americans told to do this over and over again in a ritual pattern. And um, mm -hmm. the, I think the unifying vision of Christianity and those fa fasts and feasts are obviously necessary. I think that we've lost that. And say, so I've been going to the Orthodox Church and you're getting into that a uh, pattern of celebrating the universal faith as it were and it disturbs me to see that people have traded that for something much less does that make sense yeah <laughs> did i just go off on a real tangent or is that what you're oh, I was, no, no, I was, I think that's true and, and uh so are you like are you taking seriously like the orthodox really still take seriously advent they fast as much during advent as during lent that most right, people yeah. are aware of and um, so a Catholic, you would obviously do Fridays, but not actually what Wednesdays and Fridays and everything too. So that's really, I think that appeals, especially to men. Maybe this is like a very general statement, but something difficult to do. Um, mm -hmm. in all these kind of men's groups, I think of maybe why Jordan Peterson was so popular mm -hmm. because he's like, pick up your cross and burn it, sort of, or mm -hmm. clean your room and get up right. and do it. I think a man in particular, maybe, and some women too, obviously, are attracted to that toughness or that oh, challenge yeah, of Christianity. Boot they, camp. Spiritual boot camp. I think so. I think they're sick yeah. of the um, kind of yeah, 
like I think Christiandi itself, unfortunately, as Matt was saying about the sanitized culture, I think Christiandi itself has been sanitized. And actually, um, both your works have helped me go beyond that, to be honest. So um, whenever Matt talks about uh, wrestling with the kind of existential questions and how you see that in movies like No Country for All Men or um, more serious artistic pieces, then it calls you to question. That's what, I think that's why I liked Malik so much and the, the Tree of Life, how uh, they obviously get the bad news, like the Book of Job, but at the start of the film, mm -hmm. they have to deal with that. And Malik obviously takes us around the cosmos, kind of like God himself at, at the whirlwind or whatever. And um, you have to have a post, a tragic Christian faith or something, if that makes sense. It, does that... Does that sound okay? <laughs> yeah, so I think um, I think that has that has appealed to me as an adult. So obviously, I was de facto de jure Christian growing up, but it doesn't really mean anything. And then you have to um, ask those questions, those existential questions first, and deal with it. And I think, as Matt has said before too, that the problem of evil obviously is there for Christians but it's there anyway. It just presents itself in a different form and it's yeah. not going to go away if you uh, reject the childish faith that you ha have, kind of sociologically. You're going to have to deal with a universe that goes on until there's a, a maybe supernova or whatever the hell it is, thing blows up, it's all over mm -hmm. and not remembered. There's no God to remember any of it. Uh, so why is my meaning more... Um, more important than yours and then how are we going to arbitrate between different uh, groups and individuals claims for what is meaningful or right and I don't see uh, a secularist answer that I would consider binding on people a universal vision like in Christianity that I think it's almost inevitable that you have a return to tribalism or some sort of utilitarianism that uh, people can argue against each other about because how, how are you going to define the terms, say, with Jordan Peterson and people like that? He talks about P.I.C. as a game, so you want to do the best for yourself, your family, people down the line. But why play that long game when you can play uh, an individual game? What benefits you and your ego? Mm -hmm. You can say it's better, maybe sociologically, but it's not better selfishly and for your financial reasons and so on. Does that make sense? It's. I mean, one of the things we're seeing is that a group like Black Lives Matter, the group itself is a group, a Marxist group, a Marxist identity politics. Mm -hmm. But notice it's not grabbing a hold of our young people, my college students. It's not grabbing a hold of them by presenting truthfully Marxist anti-Christian identity politics. Right, it right, right. plays on their sense of justice, fair play, charity. So it's sort of stealing from what C.S. Lewis called the Tao, the the Judeo-Christian, the, yep. the moral yep. ethical code, it, it can only get them to join on by playing on real virtues mm -hmm. to get them to follow something that's actually opposed to that whole system of virtues. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're still, you know, borrowing. Now, again, see, here, here, here's the interesting thing is that in one sense, I think film, you know, especially a you know, real aesthetic film should be the most important to Christians. But in some ways, it's the most important to the atheist because that's the atheist's only form of transcendence. Yeah. So we love these films yeah. and we love to follow where they're taking us. But without that film, we still have transcendence through a risen savior. Mm -hmm. But in some ways, the arts are more important to people who literally have nothing else. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are also refusing to have children now. So they don't even have a legacy. And it doesn't even make sense, right? I mean, you would think that the people who were having the most kids would be the complete Darwinians, right? But mm -hmm. oddly enough, it's the Darwinians who are killing themselves, right, while those right. of us who have an inheritance in heaven, and in that sense don't, quote, need the children to carry ourselves on, are the ones having the children. It's a yeah. very strange uh, irony. Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about, um, uh, you know, you mentioned a lot of things, and I, I just have a bunch of thoughts running through my head. But the, the one thing is, is that the different world we live in, in terms of um, not having a unifying meta, meta narrative, mm -hmm. um, obviously postmodernism, has come 
uh, to a great extent in the fall or uh, wake of the fall of communism and how be prior to the early 1990s, late, late 80s, that we did have a more or less unifying narrative in the United States where we had a defining narrative, which is they're communists, they're, right. that's, they're them, and we're, they're, they're atheists, we're not. Right. Even if we're not necessarily religious ourselves, we right. support religion, we, we embrace it. You know, we have uh, obviously I, um, Eisenhower putting in, in God We Trust, and putting yeah, in, yeah. in, the, in the, uh, the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance. All of these things really gave us a sense of, of cohesion and in the wake of the fall of communism, the many stories that have bubbled up since then, we've had no unifying narrative. We've had no unifying enemy, an other, to say, we're not them. This is who we are, we're not them. And therefore, that idea of atheism being, or communism being the boogeyman that's gonna come and get us in the night, or, or storm us, you know, we could think of you know, Red Dawn or something like that, right. where we were, in, you know, we were being told these stories. Now that's gone, so now we have, uh, Communism, Marxism, on the forefront, bubbling yeah. up everywhere uh, in terms of of, of um, transgenderism and uh, obviously um, uh, feminism and uh, you know Black Lives Matter. All these different types of things are are really bubbling to the surface, and nobody quite has a story um, to. And so that's why we have um, competing stories coming on right now, and we're we're at war with ourselves because we have no external enemy. Um, and, and Hollywood doesn't make, want to make an external enemy because they want to make money from everyone. So we're, no, you're right. That's, yeah. It's like James Bond. Who's your villain in a James Bond movie? They, they don't know. There's no safe villain. Right. And, right. Uh, yeah. That's, and then, uh, and then a, a, another thing thinking about uh, and thinking about fasting and feasting, uh, the different world that we live in now versus where we were, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, I know it wasn't a religious uh, fasting and, and feasting time, but in terms of our media consumption, uh, we used to have fasting and feasting in our media consumption. There were times where media was fresh, times when we realized that the new season would come out in September or October and it would run through a certain time. We'd get some reruns, then we'd have a few more at this time. And then in the summertime, there would be no new media. You would basically binge on reruns if you wanted to watch it at all because people were out doing new things. But now, because we've had a plethora of media, these, these bubbling up of new medias, and obviously the way we can consume media through Netflix and Amazon, we binge watch. And right, so right. not only do we not, we, are we not watching the, the same thing that everybody else is, when everyone else is watching it, right. we're, also fat, we're also feasting in ways when other people aren't feasting. Mm -hmm. So someone might be like, for instance, a holiday comes up and you're, you're binge watching new, a new show rather than going out with the community. Yeah. With the, with feeling a sense of of a connectionist cohesion with everybody else, like after I remember after growing up after Thursday nights was must uh, must must watch TV. You had oh, to watch right. Seinfeld. You had to watch Cheers. You had to watch all these different shows. Right. And then you come back the next day on Friday and you talk about, hey, did you watch the show last night? And that was the only time you could see it. So you've come back and as a community, you had things to to talk about. Now you go and say, have you seen so and so? Like you said, have you seen Westworld? And I'm like, that's right, yeah. No, I have. I haven't seen it. So. We, we are fragmented, not just in our, uh, our sense of losing a common enemy, we're fragmented in the way we're um, consuming media. And that really has left, have, has left us with a loss of personal identity yeah. because I, I, we really define ourselves by who we're not. We define yeah. ourselves in the difference. Meaning is found in the difference. So if we don't have a difference with somebody else, we're, we're really at a loss of, to who we really are. Um, and I, I find that, um, anyway, those are just some thoughts. Just You're right. I mean, you know, we, we've lost the difference between words like prejudice and racist, where mm -hmm. there's a good kind of prejudice that actually protects you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, right. that it's needed. We, we do need to categorize people to a certain extent to protect ourselves and live in the world. And they don't want to make a difference between that, that self-preservation and an, an actual kind of hatred of mm -hmm. the other. And, and uh, they, they just collapse those two together. And, you know, everything you're saying, Matt, this may be the reason why we have a rise in victimization. So mm -hmm. now if I'm the victim, now I've got a nice enemy over there, whether it's the white man or the heterosexual, whatever it is, I've got a nice enemy or oppressor to define who I am. And so that's why they're, they're easily falling into identity politics without understanding what it is and what right. it means. That in well, fact, identity politics actually is racist. <laughs> Because yeah. if you're reduced to your color of your skin, that's a racist way of looking at the world. Yeah, um, I, 
I just read uh, White uh, White Fragility by uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, D'Angelo. Sure. Um, but talking about that and thinking about the terms of community and community cohesion, I think this is so this is so important because um, a lot of people think uh, you know th thinking about what makes a Christian, how do we find our identity, who are we? And I think of like for instance that that that's something we've all wrestled with in terms of um, how we define ourselves in the world. When I was first saved, I wondered how I can be in the world, but not of the world. And obviously it's something that carries with you throughout the, your, your, your time as a Christian. If you're gonna dedicate yourself, how am I in the world, but not of the world? I have to live in the world, but how do I not be of the world? And obviously Christians have had a very, a wide different range of, of different options. I, I think uh, uh, Niebuhr had a book called Christ and Culture, which he basically delineated five different uh, ways of being in the world, but not of the world. Um, but uh, we had, um, thinking about the Amish, for instance, the Amish have a way of being in the world, but not of the world, which is to completely be separate, not just in, right, right. Not just in uh, location, but in dress and in style and in technology and in every way. So it's not just about religious identity, it's about also physical, um, uh, you know, the way we construct our world around those things. And so when we do that, you can always say, if you're an Amish, you always know who you're not. Right, I, I'm, right. Uh, this is I'm a Christian. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be honest. And therefore, they have a very strong community identity. And it's these people that have strong community identity, interesting enough, which which pass their their faith on to their kids. Right. If you have a strong community identity like that, like this is who we're not. This is who we are. We have this this relationship. You are going to be more likely to preserve in your um, in your faith passed on to your and, and to your and to your children uh, and grandchildren. But my thing is is that. Most Christians have, have accepted more of a, a lackadaisical understanding in terms of I don't have to be in every way separate. I'm only separate in certain ways. Like, uh, you know, some people will say I won't watch movies at all. But most right. people will find that it's okay to watch movies. Some people will say I won't watch rated R movies. That's what it means yeah. to be a Christian. I'm not going to watch rated R. Right. Or whatever they do, we, 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 we say, where's the line? Who am I? How does it mean to be a Christian? But to be a Christian means to be different. And how is that difference defined? And it's become so much more, um, you know, n there's no one person speaking for everyone. It used to be, like I said, the communists are atheists. Right. We're Christians over here. We have a religion. And now we don't have the other. And therefore, we're kind of at odds and loss right now. But talking about Black Lives Matter, um, I, I've been thinking about this because I heard, I uh, actually heard um, uh, somebody talk about this. They were talking about Barack Obama meeting Je Jeremiah Wright, Reverend Jeremiah okay. Wright. And when he went to Jeremiah Wright, uh, uh, he went to meet him for the first time. They sat down in his office and Jeremiah Wright, uh, he, uh, Barack Obama spoke with Jeremiah Wright's secretary. And the secretary said, hey, I have a son. He wants to be in a marching band and there's no marching bands in the inner city here or whatever, where they were at. And I found a great school. It's pretty much a white school, but they offer everything. They're going to pay for everything if we can get him over there. And I want to send my son to this school. And Jeremiah Wright doesn't want me to send my son to the school. So Barack Obama goes into the into the office and talks to uh, Barack uh, Jeremiah Wright about this, and and Jeremiah Robert Wright says, "Well, he'll forget who he is." Well, so here's my thing: is is the interesting thing is about about community, and I and I this is a real interesting thing because not everybody integration isn't always a good thing. There is a there is a, 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 a in the difference you have a community, and when you lose the difference, you lose the community. And like, for instance, you think of the historically black colleges, historical black colleges, right. which had a strong identity, a very strong, cohesive identity prior to the 1960s. Um, and then you see a loss of, of black identity right. um, in ways that they didn't, they had for a hundred years. I mean, like you listen to Thomas Sowell and everything like that. And they said that if you look at the rates of divorce, the rates of intact right. families and the rate, it was, it was, a remarkably strong community right. prior to inner prior to the Brown versus Board of Education and all that stuff. But once right. that came about and you destroyed black institutions, which had community indifference, and I'm not promoting racism at right. all or 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 non but there's a there's a there's a there was a real loss of identity which happens in that. And I think that's what we're suffering with today. I think more than anything is that you've got to create victims because right. you've got to create some identity and without victims you don't have an identity you have to be they, they want to some there's there's a real sense i believe in the black community that wants to maintain a sense of identity which mm -hmm. they're losing if they integrate mm -hmm. completely uh, because the larger wider culture has been 
the pilgrims, the history of right. Europeans coming to the United States. And to be subsumed into that larger narrative is to lose, in some sense, their own narrative, their own culture. And so we have to have Black History Month. We still have to have these ways of being segregated, the ways of being different. I, I don't know why I just talked about all that stuff. But, but talking about being a Christian and being in community and, and having these fast and feast times and having um, a common, different perspective that says that this is who we are, this is who we're not. And I think we've really lost that in our sense of identity. And I think, I think movies are trying to play a part in that, but they're not finding that common enemy, like you said, uh, Lou. You, they're not finding who that, who that thing is out there that we're supposed to be fearful of. Um, and so it oftentimes becomes ourselves, you know, like we see in a movie like Prestige, you know, where it's, you know, we're killing our own selves. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I'm my own, I'm my own worst enemy. Yeah. The, uh, did, did, did you see, out? Uh, did you see, um, um, uh, Watchmen on HBO? I haven't seen the HBO one, but I've seen the well, Watchmen movie. This is it? wild. I mean, it, it, it reads like what's happening today. I mean, they, basically they make the white supremacists, the bad guys, everybody's wearing masks. It's just, really strange and frightening you know and <laughs> i don't know um, uh, do you think yeah. um this sort of is inevitable once you ignore the role of the devil and spiritual war warfare in christianity itself so that uh, evil then it becomes localized in some particular group or some part of the world and maybe made a scapegoat uh, especially like in a G rene girard sort of yeah. way and that you do need a scapegoat, whereas Christ broke that system apart. But in Christianity, you still have the devil as the other that is different from all of us, and he's leading us astray, huh. as it were. But yeah, if you, yeah you, I think that's great. That's, I think you're right, right on the money. Are you, you know, Orwell got it right in 1984 when they have the hate rallies. You need to localize all your hate and your outrage is poured out on one person, the mm -hmm. scapegoat. And they're ready to sacrifice their own sometimes. I mean, uh, it all started when they sacrificed, uh, what's his name, Weinstein. Weinstein, yeah. <laughs> that, was amazing. that was their own. And actually, the most amazing one that they've thrown to the wolves is Kevin Spacey, who was their favorite, you know, openly gay guy. And they yeah. tossed him under the bus. It's yeah. unbelievable. They even spent a fortune on that movie where, what was it, Christopher Plummer had to take on the role. That, what movie was that? It was an okay movie. Uh, but they spent millions and millions of dollars because they pulled Kevin Spacey out last minute. Uh, and and uh, just, you know, I, I know, and, and of course, the, the amazing thing about the scapegoating of someone like Weinstein is that, of course, he's, I'm not on his side, but the funny thing is that the very liberals that turned against him and crucified him are the people that wrote the playbook that he followed by to become that person that he was. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's wonderful that they're, they're throwing their own under the bus. It's, it's, the people that, that were doing that were following the sexual revolution, not, mm -hmm. you know, our, our Christian morals. So it, it's, it is, you know, I guess it, it feeds on itself after a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that sort of speaks to the concern I was trying to articulate earlier, because if you do accept that materialist view of the world, then where is the stopping point? And what is the principled opposition? You can have maybe a utilitarian opposition mm -hmm. for maybe your own group's gains or whatever, you know what I mean? But um, there's no real... Um, binding moral cause, as far as I can see, maybe there is maybe there is a, a good secular argument, but I've never discovered one. I, I try and talk about this with many of my secularist friends and tease it out of them. Where is the yeah. the moral impetus that can bind that is truly universal and it can bind different communities? So over time, so it's not just power play because. Um, that seems like a dead end to me. And yeah. they, the people like Weinstein, are, they're, they're well promulgated on the internet and stuff. So, and uh, Joe Rogan and people like that. And they're presented as the opposition to this uh, more powerful ideology. But I think they're ultimately... And you were talking about Eric Weinstein, right? Not the Weinstein we were talking about, right? Well, both, I guess, both Weinstein brothers, uh, Brett yes. and yeah. Eric, um, yeah. I think because they share those common assumptions, they can't yeah. ultimately take a, a stand in the long term. Mm -hmm. I don't think they, it's only a temporary um, solution, as it were, if it's even a solution at all. Yeah. Because they don't have the meta narrative to resist it. I think some kind of atheists like Coleman Hughes are starting to realize that. Right. So whenever he had um, John McWhorter on his show, he talked about it. He 
you said about uh, I heard this criticism about uh, we lack a modern art. Well, they don't like the Enlightenment is a view Enlightenment view very simplistic positive Enlightenment view at that. Yeah is a meta narrative it's just a kind of weak one that isn't um going to stand against the new you know, deconstructionist one i don't think um mark do you listen to computing forever he's an he's an irish guy too right you know what I, i'm talking about i don't know actually yeah, yeah. In, anyway he was an atheist and uh last election prior to 2016 he was listening to like uh sargon of Agcad and a bunch of other people that got taken down obviously they've been blacklisted but he, I, I, I don't know if he's still on because I don't see, I see, I, I see him very rarely, but he was Irish and he was atheist in, in the sense of what you were just talking about. He was with Brett Weinstein and all these other guys kind of like following that. And he, in latter days, within the last year, a couple of years, he became more pro-Christian because he realized that exact same thing, what you're just talking about. He basically said, we're borrowing from Christians, Christianity, which is exactly what, um, uh, Holland, uh, Tom Holland has said in his recent book on Dominion, he said, basically, we're all Christians. Yeah. I mean, you, you got to admit that you can't just sit there and say, yeah. you know, you're sawing off the branch you're standing on. If you keep saying, yeah. so, you know, human rights, human rights, and you're sawing off the Christian tree, you're like, because all it, is, it becomes is just a, um, you, you've taken away the foundation for why you believe that. So it could be. Even Richard Dawkins has been backing off lately and oh, realizing yeah? that his pure atheism cannot sustain moral ethical behavior. So and I think that I think, I think classical liberals like like yeah. uh, Dawkins and other people are now seeing <laughs> what's happening amongst yeah. the, the college campus. And they're going, what what's what's happening? What have we been siding with? I mean, they see it bubbling yeah. up, and they're like, where do we go to to stop the the tide that's right. going to take us out? That basically the guillotines are going to get like a French Revolution, yeah. and we and we have been siding with this. We can't stop it. There's nothing that's going to stop it. I think uh, they finally studied history enough to know that they're the first people they get killed off or <laughs> sent to re-education camps. And, yeah. and, uh, and you know, they're, they're also realizing that all these liberals who were up about free speech have produced a generation that are not for free speech. Right. <laughs> Very much against it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and part of it, oddly enough, is their snowflake fragility. They don't want to hear the other side. They want to be protected. So it's mm -hmm. a very strange, they're, they're militantly against free speech but it's because they're too weak to handle free speech at the mm -hmm. same time. They can't handle that cognitive dissonance. So it's a very strange thing that we've been breeding. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think um, this is why Nancy Pearcy is so profound too, well, for on a number of different levels actually, but so whenever she goes into, you might remember this from Nancy's book, whenever she goes into the materialist reading of history, then she points to people like Hegel who notice that if you do accept the de de determinist view, then why not just treat people as an amalgamation of say you're white, um, European or whatever. So you're not treating them as moral agents, you're treating them as determined by those cultures. And why is that any less reasonable uh, versus the kind of in enlightenment, like positive enlightenment view of reason? You know what I mean? And- um, In Darwinian world, eugenics makes total sense. And in fact, it was- <laughs> It was practiced. Right. It was practiced. Uh, in our own country, we forget that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's yeah. part of their um, kind of the irony of it because they were so successful in rewriting history and looking at only the positive things of the Enlightenment. Now that the, the dark elements are coming back, they don't know how to deal with it. Whereas if they had have been honest about history, they would have talked about the guillotines and things in the French Revolution. And the, 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 the Darwinian elements that you're talking about there, Luke, whereas um, Dawkins and people like that for so long were just peddling this completely fanciful notion of materialism. Um, Nazi point, points that out, out so brilliantly too, that in order for their systems to make sense, they have to exempt themselves and view, the, view themselves mm -hmm. as these enlightened beings above the world and the mm -hmm. ideologies don't apply to them they played everybody else but them yeah yeah i you know uh, my, my book here uh, atheism on trial oh it's backwards but i actually quote a number of quotes that nancy puts together in finding truth one of her books and it's just a few quotes by atheists to show that they cannot live by their principles and a few of them are amazing one one's albert einstein said i am compelled to act as if free will existed because if I want to live in a civilized society, I must act responsibly. 
So I, I, I have to live, even if I don't believe it, right? Uh, yeah. This guy, Marvin Minsky, no matter that the physical world provides no room for freedom of the will. That concept, freedom of the will, is essential to our models of the mental realm. We can never give it up. We're right. virtually forced to maintain that belief, even though we know it's false. I love this one by Edward Slingerland. At an important and ineradicable level, the idea of my daughter as merely a complex robot carrying my genes into the next generation is both bizarre and repugnant to me. Such a reductionist view inspires in us a kind of emotional resistance and even revulsion. Yeah. They know that, but they still have it. I mean, you, know, you, can't, you can't live by the, these rules. And, yeah. and I remember uh, Lewis quotes Aristotle as saying that the, the kind of qualities that democracy breeds are often not the same virtues that democracy needs to survive. Mm -hmm. Often democracy breeds the very thing that will destroy it. Uh, yeah. and now, to, to just to show you what it's like, the one atheist that does have the courage of his convictions is Peter Singer, who mm -hmm. comes right out and basically says a full-grown dog has more rights than a newborn baby. I mean, it, mm -hmm. at least he's got the courage of his convictions and just says what is yeah. consistent. It's still with disgusting. <laughs> yeah, frightening. Yeah, and, and Nazi talks about, too, in Love Thy Body, how they have redefined the notion of person so that it's not the, what she calls the lower story human versus the upper story uh, person. And now that um, animals can be persons uh, more than some humans mm -hmm. based on their um, what a stage of development they're at and things like that. Say they haven't developed certain cognitive skills so that you respect the person, which... Might, might explain why some of the animal rights people seem to value animals more than they do certain humans, which is disturbing. And it's just such, it, as, like, as those quotes reveal, it's a nonsense view of the world that they obviously do choose to live with. Do you, why do you think they choose to live with that? Do you think it's because they don't want to, like um, another one, Thomas Nagel, who's pretty consistent, mm. he says he doesn't want to live in a universe with God and having to take on that moral responsibility and everything. Or do you think, it's probably both, or do you think it's like somebody like Douglas Murray, who just seems to literally not believe in the resurrection. He just thinks historically it didn't happen. Whereas it can respect Douglas Murray more, but I think a lot of them are oh. maybe um, more the first, the first one that I mentioned, where they do want to take on the responsibility, so they're willing to live with those yeah. inconsistencies. Do you have any thoughts about that? That's why the Hollywood people love to become Buddhists, because the Buddhist of Hollywood is someone who gets to have all the warm fuzzies of being a spiritual person mm -hmm. while not being accountable to anything. Lewis mm -hmm. said, that's why pantheism is the greatest religion. When the sun <laughs> is shining and you feel great, you want to have someone to thank. But when you want to do something really oily, then it's nice to know the universe couldn't care less. Yeah. And so we get to have our cake and eat it too. And that, that's, that's what we want. We want a guilt-free religion, accountability-free religion. We don't like... You know, so a lot of times, like the radical feminist, she doesn't just hate male authority. She just hates all authority. In mm -hmm. fact, feminists often hate female authority even more than male authority. They really get uh, <laughs> on, on that sort of thing. And so we just don't want to be accountable to anything or anyone. And so we want to, or, you know, or we might just get a kind of deism, a soft deism where God's not really a person. He doesn't you know, hate some things and love other things. This all goes back to Spinoza. Spinoza was already rejecting the Jewish God because God doesn't have pre preferences. He doesn't love some and hate others. He's just neutral. Uh, and and that, that's what they want. But that's certainly not the God revealed in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Do you think a, at a sociological level that people in that liberal classical liberal camp say, like Dave Rubin seems to be quite aware of what's happening. Mm -hmm. It's hard for him because he's homosexual to go to say Orthodox Judaism or Christianity because of the restrictions against homosexuality, I guess. So he's got that dissonance that he's gonna to have to live with. But others like that, do you think whenever they look to the new uh, critical theory crowd and how totalitarian they are, that, oh, suddenly Christianity is gonna seem 
reasonable and uh, oh, yeah. actually want to join in with these ones rather than uh, have the world tied over to um, the deconstructionists. I think, do you speak about this actually in your book, Louis, about people like um, Voltaire, Voltaire who sort of privately didn't believe but uh, wanted oh. to use religion? You might be thinking of the funny story where Voltaire would have his uh, atheist friends come to dinner with him and he'd say to them, just don't talk too loud about atheism when the servants are around or they might start stealing the silver. At that point, <laughs> right, you know, that he understood that, you know, well, we need it for other people. And, and again, it, it's kind of going back to the Black Lives Matter. We, we are espousing something that's actually anti-Christian, but we're getting people to follow us by appealing to their Christianity. Yep, yep. And one of my favorite scenes in uh, 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 The Magician's Nephew is Uncle Andrew you know, is doing these evil experiments using guinea pigs and then using children. And he's a Nietzschean ubermensch. He's above middle-class morality. But the only way he can, he can get Diggory is when Diggory, uh, you know, was waffling about going to save his, his, uh, his friend. He says to him, I hope no nephew of mine will show the white feather. Mm -hmm. So that's, in other words, you're not going to be a coward, are you? So he appeals to him in the name of the very moral code that Uncle Andrew believes he's above, you know, yeah. the will to he power is yeah. above in a Nietzschean way. It's the only way he can appeal to him. So everybody, and like I said, you know, because I'm always talking about the Tao, Lewis's code, and when I defend it, I said, look, I can talk to you for an hour about the, about the Tao, but the easiest way to define and defend the Tao is that the Tao is defined as the way you expect other people to treat you. Mm -hmm. And there it is, right there. You still expect other people to treat you by a sort, sort, sort of understood moral code written in our conscience, even if you think you're above it and don't have to abide by it. Mm -hmm. uh, do yeah, you, what do you think? Um, sorry, Max, do you want to go? I was going to say, it's pretty um, amazing. I, I, would, I would think just like you were talking about in terms of having kids and how they espouse Darwinian evolution and basically the survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. Well, the fittest, the ones who survive are the ones who have the majority of kids. And yet the very thing that they are they're buying into is obviously undermining the whole, the whole program. So it's like, they think they're above it, yet they're undermining what it is to be alive and what evolution, it, let's just say it is evolution, has taught us to be. And therefore you're like going, you're not even living in sync with your own values or morals or whatever it is that you say you are. It's undermining, it's, it's um, but they're just eating their, they're eating themselves. And I would say that why haven't they adopted if religion is the thing which evolution has produced, if they believe this, True. to cause more people to survive, then why would they not promote religion in, in the name of the, uh, the noble lie or right. whatever, in terms of saying that we need to have this in order to continue existing? But the thing is, is we have no enemies. So yeah. why, 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 why fight for anything? We have no enemies. We, have, we are well fed, we are well supplied, and we have no enemies. And we're looking for an enemy is what we're looking for. Sad to say, you know, we're probably going to find one. It's amazing how prophetic Tolkien was when he talked about the Numenorians when they went bad. That's the island of Numenor behind me there. Uh, of what happened to the Numenorians and also what happened to the Gondorians. Mm -hmm. And he said, as they lusted for immortality, he mm -hmm. said there were you know old men in towers trying to extend their life, but not having children. <laughs> and it would seem like those things are contradictory, but that's exactly what's happening now. Yeah. At the same yeah. moment when people are, you know, whether or not they can do it, it doesn't make a difference. They're talking seriously about uploading their consciousness into a computer so they can live forever. Uh, yeah. Just the fact that they would think that's even appealing or want to do it at the same time as being childless. It's, it's a very strange, it seems contradictory, but Tolkien saw already how the two go together. I think Interstellar really deals with that issue. Did we talk about this a little bit before? Uh, Interstellar, the idea is that they want to prolong the human race. So in order to do that, they send out 12 uh, astronauts without attachments. They're unmarried. They have no kids. And they send those people out. And they're saying that those people are going to be the ones who save the human race. But it actually is a father who is able to save the human race because he's the only one who has a connection with the child. And that's the, that's the message of the film. And it wants to try to, it utilizes the idea of obviously gravitational pull and the idea of the singularity in a black hole is that we don't know the difference between classical mechanics, classical um, um, cosmo, um, 
classical physics versus uh, quantum mechanics right. and how those things come together, we are still pulled apart in two different realms that, that basically we don't know how these things can come together. But yet there's somehow, somehow in a black hole, we're going to find the singularity, the moment, the thing that brings it all together. And in that, it's the relationship between a father and, her, and his daughter. It's the relationship, a one-time moment between. That's and right. so I think, I think Nolan is, is a far more, he's, he's fairly conservative in his thought, even yeah. if he doesn't espouse a religion. He's trying to say, yeah. we need to have kids, even yeah. if we want to save the human race, which is most people who are trying to save the human race are, um, they're uh, anti, um, what do you call them? Not, not anthropomorphic, but uh, what do you call it when you don't like humanity? Oh, misanthropes. Misanthropes, yeah. yeah. They're misanthropic. So they, they want to get rid of, uh, 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 of humans in order to save humanity. It's like, yeah. what? what? <laughs> save the planet, you know? Who, yeah. who would have known? I, I did enjoy Noah, but we have this idea that, that God is actually destroying mankind because we're, we're mean to nature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's still an interesting movie, actually. But, the, uh, but, but, but yeah, it, that, that is odd. You know, and, and like I said, it, it all comes down to the way we define words because if by tolerance you mean that everybody's made in the image of God and therefore has a central worth, that's fine. But what tolerance has come to mean is I overlook your sins if you overlook my sins, right? Environmentalism should mean uh, what they call, you know, stewardship, you know, uh, creation care, what God gave us a job. But what it really means is that nature is more important than man. Multiculturalism should mean respecting all the different uh, cultures, but what it means in, in the public schools is Western culture is bad, so we're using all the other cultures to destroy it, but we don't actually respect those cultures. So mm -hmm. we actually like radical Islam, even though it's against everything I believe as a radical feminist, I like them because I'll use them to destroy the Christians, but yeah. I don't really like So again, it, it, it's these words, they, they, one of my favorite ones is the phrase, uh, John Dewey's phrase, um, values clarification which mm -hmm. sounds like you're trying to teach virtue when it's the absolute opposite. It means trying to help the student come up with his own values yeah. or the common core, which sounds like the great books, but it's the opposite of the great books. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think we're, that means we're, def we're, we're, definitely, we're definitely eating ourselves. And that's the yeah. thing is we have a lot of self-hatred. And like I said, we need an enemy and the enemy is us. And we yeah, that's right, that's right. this is. idea that even though we, in many ways we like ourselves, it just seems to be like we, we're, use, we're utilizing and also hating ourselves at the same time. We're drawing on our history to hate ourselves. Um, it's, it's, an odd, it's an odd duality. Uh, that we're, we're, we're stuck in, uh, what was that called? Uh, the, the, the one with Schwarzenegger uh, on Mars. Uh, total Recall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're the villain yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Interesting. Right. So, um, more positively then, how do you think that Christians should respond to deconstructionists and their many vices? What, what emphasis should we place in um, dealing with people, do you think? What's the best way to um, evangelize those people? Well, it, it goes back to, to, to that idea of meta narrative. We just have to have a better story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we need to present that story of creation, fall, redemption, reconciliation, restoration. We need to, to, to make it real. We need to make our magic the best kind of magic. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to, to show that, that, that we've got, uh, you know, so that people will say what, what the disciples said to Jesus, uh, will you lead me to? And, and they basically say, where are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. Logos made flesh. Somebody uses mm -hmm. that phrase, I think. Uh, <laughs> I want to hear Matt, because Matt, Matt has really been digging into deconstruction lately and postmodernism and what we can learn from it and what we can't learn from it. And what, what are you getting at? It? You I just really think, uh, I think that we have, uh, we have to talk about meaning. I think that, you know, rather than starting off with the notion of, you know, sin and salvation, which I think is inherent in the idea, basically it's like this, the, the, the Western world, we, um, I, I, I did a message a while back called how do we witness to a culture that no longer feels guilty. And then yet in Christianity, since basically Jonathan Edwards and obviously on down through, you know, Luther and the Reformation has always hinted on the idea of sin and morality as the means of finding ourselves, our salvation. So we have to come to a recognition of our sin, a recognition of our state, and that recognition of our state is the, pre is the, is the predicate for finding salvation in Christ. So if you do not feel that, that impulse to say, I'm a sinner and I need a savior, then you're not going to find a savior in Christ. 
So some of the preaching and how it has developed over the past two, 300 years has been trying to push the idea of you're a sinner. So I'm going to tr try to prove to you you're a sinner, and then you're going to find salvation. I think there's a guy, uh, I don't know his name, uh, I can't remember his name, but he has living water. Kirk, Kirk Cameron was with this guy for a while. I don't know his name, um, but he did the whole thing about trying to show that people, you're a sinner. You know, you oh, sin, right. you're a sinner, you sin, you're a sinner, and you're trying to prove that. I just don't think that in a, what we've done in today is we've ran from the notion of sin because that got overblown. I mean, it was almost like the burned out pilgrims after a couple hundred years, right. after living in New, in New England. Uh, you know, the, the world of the Reformation, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, revolution was very, was not very Christian, even though there was a lot of churches oh, and right. stuff like that. It was, yeah. it was not a lot of people went to church. I think it was like 20% or 25% oh, yeah. of the population actually went to church in, in, uh, in the 17, you know, 75 when the revo uh, revolution uh, went out. So it wasn't a strongly Christian country because there was a lot of people who were just kind of like, they'd live this moral, moral uh, life for a very long time, and they were just kind of burned out, just kind yeah. of burned out. Then you had the Second Great Awakening come along. You had the first one, obviously, in the early uh, 1700s and the one in the early 1800s. But this, this is where this, we have the fruits of that, 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 that Reformation, that, um, sorry, the um, Great Awakening that's uh, to this day, we, we bear the, the, the marks of both in England and in here. Um, but anyway, my point is, is that we kind of, we, in the last, I would say, 100 years, 50 years, we've kind of got burned out in America on that idea of finding sin. And therefore, we just kind of got lackadaisical in our understanding of, of, of we wanted to accept the fact that there can be many voices. We wanted to accept that the fact that there is no right and wrong. We wanted because it was so easy to, because if we do that, we give permission to ourselves to sin. And right. therefore, there is no, there is no problem. So basically, I'm burned out. I'm tired of being guilty. I'm tired of feeling guilty. So there's a, there's a rush away, a, a pulling away from, from God or this idea of church or this idea of Catholicism or any type of thing to rush away from it, to find freedom, to live my impulses, to just right. to be a sinner and not to feel guilty about it anymore the problem with that is and that's where our culture is yeah. you know even if they're nominally christian if somebody says i believe in god they don't live like it they don't live like it any longer at least in the traditional religious way that we've always talked about it because they say yes i believe in god but he has no moral connection to how they're living their life it's like yes i believe in god what's that mean well i believe there's a life after death I believe that uh, good things will happen to me. I believe whatever, but it's not that I bear moral responsibility for my actions or behavior. If I'm punished, it'll be by the government. If I don't, I'll get away with it. So there's this idea of there's no connection there. But the problem with that is, it has the more idea of, of everyone gets a trophy. And so mm -hmm. that in our life that we've been, we've been raised in, we've been given uh, trophies out. I don't know if this is in, in uh, where you're from, Mark, but we have this idea that, Everybody gets a participation trophy. Right. So everybody gets praised on the same level as everyone else. And everyone just kind of like, it, it, now it feels like nothing that I do matters. So now you have men, particularly talking about the people that Peterson and Brett Weinstein and yeah. all those guys reach out to, they, a bunch of men who don't feel why they should actually, you know, do anything. Right. They have, basically, they can get sex any way they want it. There's no drive to do anything or excel. And they're angry and bitter because basically their lives haven't turned out the way they wanted to, but nobody's expected anything from them. Yeah. Nobody's asking anything from them. So this moral malaise of saying that no life is better than any other life. So simply just take the life as you get. Don't try very hard because why would I try? Because every life is the same. So don't, don't work for anything. So I think that if you start to talk about those feelings of I have, um, embrace this idea of multiculturalism, this idea of uh, deconstruction, this idea of just um, postmodernism, that all paths lead to God and nothing really matters. And um, your truth is just as good as my truth. You know, we're just all kind of, then you really feel like the sense of no identity, no purpose, no drive, no nothing. And basically it becomes self-hatred because yeah. you have no sense of core sense of self. So if you drive down and drill down into that, which I believe some movies are doing, they're drilling down because they're questioning, who am I? Why do I exist? Why do I have purpose? Why do I have value in a world where there is no such thing? Well, then you go ask yourself, you go, if you, get, if you drill down and start asking that, I had a friend of mine, a uh, guy I just met uh, on through the internet. Uh, he's an ex-Muslim living in uh, Florence. Um, he's from Tunisia. Um, 
and his name is Muhammad. So he, um, but he's, he read, he read um, Roland Barthes and, um, you know, Death of the Author. And he's read, I mean, obviously that's just a little article, but he's read all of the um, existential philosophers. You know, we're talking about uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and um, mm-hmm. Jacques Derrida. Not, he's not an existentialist, but I mean, in terms of, of, of this postmodern philosophy. Um, and he's really bought into it. And I was talking to him. Did I, have I told this, about, uh, uh, Lou, have I told you this story? So I was telling, I was telling him, and uh, I was talking to him, and he was, and, and it was really cool because he came to my, I met him. I'm sorry, I'm going off on this, Mark. Um, I met him because I asked him to, to design a logo for Logos Made Flesh. I met him on Fiverr, and I met him on this, basically, this, this internet chat. So we got together, and we sat down and had like an hour or two-hour conversation on the internet, uh, like a chat like we're doing right now. And, you know, so I didn't know where he's at. I think he's Muslim. You know, he starts, but we start, as he starts sharing, he's talking about this world that is much more Western than it is, than it is Eastern in that respect. He starts talking about his loss of self and identity and the fact that his brother, his older brother, who he says is much smarter than me, he's, this guy's a very smart guy. He's going to get his doctorate at this college, uh, this university in Florence uh, for art. Um, his brother came from Tunisia, an engineer, went to Paris to become an engineer ended up smoking pot, ended up smoking pot, returned to Tunisia to live with mom, and all he does is watch pornography and masturbate every day. And he says, and he says, and he says, you know, my worldview, because he's a nihilist, he claims to be a nihilist, my worldview says that's okay, but it's not good. Yeah. And I said, well, then why would you accept it as the true reality? If it's not good, then why would you accept it as being right? as if it is acceptable, as if that is, that, that our whole way we're designed, like for instance, if the evolutionist says we're designed to procreate and we're designed to pass on our genes, why would you live as if we're not meant to <laughs> yeah. pass on our genes? You live as if you're above it all, like you, your mind has suddenly freed you from it all. So if you go back and drill down to that, I think that's where we can really uh, delve into deconstructionism and start to confront the, the issues um, uh, by, exposing them i mean a great movie like ex machina i think does a great job because you have caleb who's left in the you know he's left locked in the computer that's right, like a- you know we're, we're looking at these screens of glass you know all day long and that's exactly where caleb is at at the end he's trapped behind glass because he's trapped behind a screen because he's watching pornography he's watching things about the unreal and the the real is walking away and leaving him abandoned and trapped behind the glass um and so you have this reversal of the real and the unreal. The unreal becomes real. The real becomes unreal um, because um, basically he's given over to this whole philosophy. So I think it's a really good way because it, it really hits people, punches people in the gut, punches people in the gut in a way that goes, that, that can't be it. That, this, there has to be something more. And I, well, I think that's well, why it's a, I, I was amazed to find all about the same time you started seeing the... Um, uh, what do they call Hunger Games movies? And then there was the Insurgent series, and then there was the 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 people in the maze. Maze Runner. Maze Runner, yeah. But it's it's weird because they're all sort of you know post apocalyptic. They're all society where the kids are ultimately in some ways or another programmed. Mm-hmm. And and it's weird because I, when I watch it, I just get the sense that the kids reading this are horrified by it and yet oddly drawn towards it at the same time. You know, because vertigo is the fear of falling and the desire to fall all mixed together. And, mm-hmm. you know, again, it, all right, put me in that, in that world where I don't have to make any choices, where I'm just, boom, where I'm told to be what I am and that's it. And so it, it's sort of like that, you know, the handmaiden's tale is something that the feminists hate and yet are oddly drawn towards it so they can be a victim forever. It's a, mm-hmm. I, I think it's psychologically disturbing, actually, uh, mm-hmm. that they're drawn to the very thing they say they hate um, because they don't want to make any decisions. Mm-hmm. And, and, and don't want to grow up, whatever, in that sense. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what world, and like, of course, all, this, all these troubles are now being magnified 10 times by this quarantine. Everybody's stuck at home. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Looking by Zoom, and we can't even be face to face anymore. Uh, and so um, that's just, uh, it's made it worse. And, and I guess what scares me about the, sh- the immediate shift from quarantine to the looting of Black Lives Matter is that basically whoever they are exactly right turned us into passive sheep and then with the flip of a dime turned us into active wolves and predators and mm-hmm. just boom like that 
without any, and then, all right, then go back into your cage and then we'll let you out and we'll put you back in. Uh, and and uh, how easy it was to manipulate us. This is the world, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. That was The Hollow Men by T.S. Eliot. Uh, yeah. And that, that's kind of frightening that that's all it took. It just took a, a little sickness out there that is probably only about three times worse than the regular flu and puts us all in terror. Right. And, uh, and then, and now we've created a whole new morality about that. So I'm a virtuous person because I wear a mask, whatever it is. Yeah. Right now, now I am actually virtuous. I think that's the, the whole rise in animal rights. I can do whatever I want, but I'm being nice to animals. So I'm virtuous. I mm -hmm. sleep around, but I recycle. So now I can feel good about myself. It reminds me of, it reminds me of Greta Thunberg, Thunberg uh, the young gal, you know, and she's going to UN talking about how basically we're destroying the planet and how we not, need to not destroy the planet. And then all of a sudden COVID comes along and she's out there basically telling us how we, we need to stay indoors and not die from COVID. And I'm going, wait, I thought COVID was the solution to your problem. <laughs> I mean, that's if, right, if, that's if, true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, if you want to go out and say where, I, I don't know, now you, now you have to get out there and say you're on the side of this. And I'm like, well, wait, your whole thing was to that's save right. the planet and, and to have less people is to save the planet. So now you have COVID. Now, why are you on the other side saying COVID's, you need to protect people from COVID now? I, I so it's amazing. well, you know, they, they made that movie uh, Inferno. That was the new Dan Brown thing. And in the movie, uh, you know, the, the, the bad guys are basically trying to put a poison in the water that will kill like a third of the population. Mm -hmm. And I didn't read the book, but I was reading about it. And apparently the book is different. In the book, they're putting something in the water that will sterilize a third of the world. And it, it's clear to me why they changed it, because there are a lot of people out there who would actually oh, do that oh. to the water if they could. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe Dan Brown has turned out to be more conservative than we thought if he's realizing that the attack is actually on procreation and on people and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so which, uh, which yeah. brings up that and that brings up an interesting thing about basically children of men. The oh, idea yeah, that was, was good. Oh, and and that's, like, he's a believer, P.D. James. Yeah. And that and that really does bring out the the whole chaos. And again, another way of, of talking about the, the abandonment of life. Um, yeah. in ourselves and and what's going to happen as a result is basically we have this world tearing itself apart is that we have nothing to live for there's right. no when we realize in stark detail that no one's going to have a child not not just me that i can i can yeah. i can step away and say i'm i'm above that and i won't have children right. but someone's got to have children yeah i remember talking to these i remember talking to the people that i work with you know i was working at the at the jail and i was talking to people who do not have kids mm -hmm. and i said do you do you realize that you know the the whole system is designed to have kids. And the fact that you're not having kids right. is basically putting a the world at risk. You're being mm -hmm. you're acting very selfish in the sense that you're not participating in the system right. in which you all need to participate in, because that's how our system with social security works, is that we yeah, all have true. kids in order to work and help each other out. But if you say, you know what, I'm not gonna have kids, and you know, obviously you get taxed a little bit more for that. But if you don't have kids, you're you're saying that um, yeah, you're, you're just leading to a world that's not going to be able to, sur to, to survive. Um, and it's ultimately selfish and, and, and tearing us all down. But anyway, I don't remember exactly my point, but. Uh. <laughs> it's, uh, but you know, again, we've got to, but again, the very fact that even, you know, Christian kids are jumping on the Black Lives Matter bandwagon shows us that we've not offered them any compelling thing to be a part of they, you know so many of them say i'm looking for something bigger than myself well mm -hmm. <laughs> can't we, we can't offer them anything compelling that they want to be part you know the the men abandoned church and what was the book called the feminization of the church the men don't feel like uh, there's anything masculine i mean uh, uh, promise keepers did a great job somebody told me that they may be coming back that would be nice because they were a, um, a great group uh mm -hmm. and uh, they were a group that was also devoted to um racial reconciliation you know, mm -hmm. it was, was, it was a heart of, of one of their messages. And yet they were picking it all the time when they met. By like feminists. You know, because and, also um, as, yeah. The feminists hated, uh, 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 hated that whole movement, even though it was a movement that was trying to make good fathers and husbands, which is exactly what women want. But they picketed promise keepers every time it happened. Because it was for a traditional family is what it yeah. was. And just and like you, BLM. By the way, just, have, have you read the Black Lives Matter? Yeah, it says we're against yeah. the nuclear family. Right. And, and again, here's another sad misuse of language. When Hillary Clinton many years ago said, it takes a village to raise a child, 
Well, actually, understood properly, that's a very Christian understanding. But what she meant by it was it takes the government to raise a child. <laughs> what the African state, you know, uh, proverb meant. So she's yeah. stealing something. And, and uh, because, yeah, the nuclear family does work well when it has a community around it. But and what and what and I think go back and what makes what makes a community yeah. a sense of identity a sense of otherness a that's sense true, of yeah. boundaries and saying that we're not everything we're not simply yeah. and that and that seems to be where our society wants to take us is that we're just everything there is no defining of meaning there is no definition between you know there's no everything's the same there is no uh, difference anyway and actually to go back to where we started with the brothers Grimm. Um, the Brothers Grimm was part of German nationalism. It was mm -hmm. part of getting a sense of yourself by collecting those fairy oh, tales. Or, yeah. or uh, you know, somebody like Robert Burns out of Scotland, uh, where you're starting to gather together all the, the folk tunes and the folk songs, and you're having a sense of who you are. And now again, we, we've demonized anything that's like patriotism or... or uh, uh, you know, a sense of nationalism as necessarily evil because it was misused here and there. But right. nationalism, that gives us an identity. And, you know, the way our culture worked, the way America grew, you know, the word uh, ghetto didn't used to be so super negative. It, you know, back then there was an Irish ghetto, there was a Greek ghetto, a Jewish one, an Italian one, a Chinese one. And the idea was at first you came here, you, you bonded together, you got a sense of yourself and only once you had that sense could you integrate into the society without actually losing yourself. Uh, well, and, but, and, and, and this is, and, and it, but it took several generations. I mean, yeah, you, yeah. you think that they come in here and they, they became that thing, but, but to integrate, to leave yeah. that community was in some sense to lose some of the cohesion you had in that community. So you had to give up. So yeah. people who are Irish here in the United States, you know, they might get together on St. Patty's Day, drink a, drink a, you know, yeah. a pint, and, uh, and, you know, basically watch some soccer or something like that. Right. But there's not much else that yeah. unifies, unless you're in Boston, perhaps if you're Boston Irish or whatever, Chicago right. Irish. But, but there's lots of people, but for the most part, Irish aren't the stigmatized and demonized people they were in the 1800s when they right. came over here. I mean, they were really a cohesive yeah, were, group right. because they were not integrated in the larger, the larger whole. They were Irish, they were Catholic, and Catholic here was to be separate. It was to be yeah. distinct. Now Catholicism doesn't, isn't seen as the uh, the difference that it used to be, right. um, but when it was, particularly for the Italians and particularly for the Irish, right. there was a strong community for Italians. There was a strong community for Irish because their cultural identity in Catholicism made them separate from the wider WASP community here right. in, the, in the in the United States. So, but again, if you leave those things behind and in, it, you have to leave those things behind to integrate into the wider community right. and therefore to become to change your identity to become part of the larger community is to lose that sense of identity with your former community um so um yeah um I mean, you know, that's a balance we used to do well in this country but i think we've forgotten how we either mm -hmm. lose ourselves or we get balkanized into you know angry fighting identities and then we've lost the ability to, I mean, Rome was greatest when they were able to bring people in and make them citizens. And Athens used to do that for a while. And England even did it for a certain, certain extent. We've, we've lost that, uh, that mm -hmm. ability because partly because we no longer believe in ourselves. <laughs> we no longer believe in, in, you know, our ideas because, you know, our ideas of liberal democracy and free market capitalism were able to absorb. I mean, like I said, what really, really gets me mad, gentlemen, is when they take, and in fact, Oh, somebody was showing me uh, that there's this African-American museum where they've got this, this whole board about what white people are. And, you know, basically it's the family values, right? And it's like, excuse me, you know, I teach in, a, in, a, in, a, in Houston, so it's very, very multi-ethnic. And the people that fit that thing are, are my Indian and Chinese students, even more than my, my white students right now, yeah. because they, you know, the family values are not tied to the color of your skin. I mean, they're, they're a good way of having a family and, and you do well in our country. And I understand why in America, we so easily bought into the sort of heretical or at least heterodox notion of, you know, God will, pro you know, will profit and, and get richer if we're Christians. And that's because we're lucky enough to live in a system, America, where if you live by Christian values, you will actually normally make more money and be more successful. 
That mm -hmm. wasn't the case if you grew up in communist China or Soviet Russia. We just happened to be in a society where, you know, saving and, and not sleeping around and having family, all these things actually make you succeed in our country. We're just right. lucky that happened, but that's not the case in ancient Rome or other places like that. Yeah.